All right, everybody, welcome to a wonderful uh, hurricane infested Friday afternoon. Uh, we'll finish up a little bit of Egypt when we get back, but here we are going on with the last civilization that'll be in our first test, which I have podcasted, so uh, make sure you guys please listen to that. And we're moving over from Egypt. We started over here. I don't know if you can see my uh, little um, clicker um, in Lower Egypt. Now we're coming over to what we know as the Middle East. And it is the area known as Mesopotamia. The word Mesopotamia simply means the land between two rivers. And it is a very key spot in the world. It is also known as the Fertile Crescent because the two rivers, the Tigris to kind of the north and the east and the Euphrates down and to the left, which is to the south and the west right there, um, are these two rivers. And running between them, if you can see that, that green strip of land there, running from the Persian Gulf over to the Mediterranean Sea, is this one area where um, flooding soil will exist in this desert. So you have these two major rivers, not one, but two, um, that exist in this hot, very difficult land in which to live in. And why it is key, because the Fertile Crescent or ancient Mesopotamia is known as the crossroads of the world because it connects the continents of Asia to Africa and Europe. You can't go between the three without going through Mesopotamia. So they are gonna be characterized throughout their history as traders. They are movers and shakers of cultural diffusion and goods. Eventually the Great Silk Road is going to run right smack dab through here. Problem is, unlike Egypt, the Fertile Crescent has no natural barriers. So when you've got different groups from, from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, from even from like the southern part of Russia coming in, you get this melting pot of people who look different, who speak different languages, who worship different religions, and it creates a very turbulent, violent atmosphere as people are competing for resources. So that makes it very difficult. There's a thing that I call a round robin tournament. When a round robin tournament is, is you get to play everybody. Even if you lose, you keep on um, and going unless you lose a few more times. So we're gonna look at seven to eight different civilizations that will be king of the mountain. They're gonna make a significant contribution to world history. Then they are gonna be knocked off the mountain and a new group will um, arise. So the Fertile Crescent, is increasingly important, but in this turbulent, violent atmosphere, several contributions are going to be made. So ancient Mesopotamia will begin right here, the very narrowest part on my clickers that can't see the red dot, in what is today Baghdad, Iraq. It is perhaps the oldest city in the entire world. It is here where civilization first began, a couple hundred years ahead of Egypt. Um, around 3200 BC in Mesopotamia, writing is created. So they predate Egypt by just a, a little bit. So we have food surplus, we have this um, stable civilization, but the problems come from the two rivers. And a lot of what we know about this comes from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is a long narrative poem about an ancient king and a flood that is going to destroy the entire world. Every civilization, from the Mesopotamians to the ancient Hebrews with Noah and the Ark, to the Cherokee of North Carolina and Georgia, to the Chinese, have a story of a great flood. And unlike the Nile River, which we know floods like clockwork every July. The origins of the Tigris and Euphrates are high up in the mountains of Turkey, right in here. And so um, it depends upon the amount of snow that fell in the mountains and when the spring thaw came. 
So the ancient Mesopotamians were always playing a guessing game. Do we plant our crops now and have them wash away in the flood? Do we wait a little bit and have them dry up in the sun? So it made life there very, very, very difficult. The Epic of Gilgamesh is the story, and it's where we find the oldest known form of writing known as cuneiform, which we were able to decipher using the uh, thing called the Behistun Rock that was found um, uh, right around the, uh, in the middle of what I believe is um, Iran. So these river problems are going to cause um, a big problem, controlling the rivers. And the problem with it is there was not a lot of natural resources in this area. There wasn't a lot of rock or stone or even timber to build things with. And so this flooding is going to be the single biggest factor that's going to cause all of these different villages. You look different than me, you, you speak different than me, you worship different than me, so we're going to fight and we're going to try and kill each other until it was probably priests from the southern part of the Persian Gulf that went northward and they said, hey guys, we need to work together to control the river flooding. And they were making earthen dams and dikes, like big giant, you know, um, hills made of like mud and like clay. Problem is like a, if you ever build a sand castle and it gets wet, they wash away. So they had to work together and they find out that if they take some of that river mud and they mix it with straw and put it in the 130 degree heat of the desert, it can bake itself into a brick. So ancient Sumeria, the world's first civilization, is where people were fighting for these resources. Eventually they're going to work together and they're going to build giant, perfectly geometric cities. And here is where there are going to be a key role where they're going to start trading with each other. Eventually connecting into India, the Spice Road, over into China and into Africa. The people of the Middle East will be movers and shakers of trade. Now, Sumerian cities are going to be very interesting. Um, they are going to be built in a grid pattern which lets us know that they understand geometry, so they understand complex mathematics. They are also going to be built roughly uniform and very quickly, so we know that they were highly organized. So going back to the pyramids, we also know that they had to have a strong central government. Someone is going to say, this is what we are going to do and how we are going to do it. But in Mesopotamia, uh, different from the ancient pharaohs, each city was its own country. This is where we get that definition of a city-state that we had talked about um, earlier in Paleo and Neolithic man. And so each is going to operate with their own set of rules, their own government. And early rulers were probably priest kings. They were probably a theocracy. They got people to work together to solve the unpredictable flooding. And then later on, warrior males are going to take over. But the early rulers had to maintain defense, um, figure out the irrigation systems living in the um, harsh desert, to enforce laws right from wrong. And in Mesopotamia, the, the, instead of like the king fighting from the rear, he had to lead the armies into battle. And rulers, unlike the pharaohs, here's a big difference, they were not seen as living gods, but they were seen as the chief servant of the gods. So that is a pretty big difference between the two different civilizations being the servant of the gods or an actual god. A um, couple other things. Um, the Mesopotamians are going to build this structure, which is known as a ziggurat. Z-I-G-G-U-R-A-T. It will be very similar to an Egyptian pyramid, and it serves two purposes. Number one, it is in the exact center of the city. 
all the main avenues led towards the ziggurat. Ziggurats, like the Greek Acropolis, up on top is the temple to where the chief god or goddess of the city lived. And inside that wall are stair shapes, um, like a giant step pyramid. And that served two reasons. Number one, the god or the goddess of the city would sometimes get bored. And I'll show you guys this if you remind me next time we're in school. Um, so sometimes they would take human form. They would walk down those stairs. They would walk through the market. They would see their people and interact. And then when they were bored, they would climb back up to hang out in their temple. The other thing that was significant about these stairs is based on your social position, the higher your social class, the taller step you could get to to worship the god or the goddess. So the king and the high priest on top, then the rich powerful nobles, then the artisans, then the peasants, and on the very bottoms were the slaves and the criminals. So it kind of dictated your social position as well. Um, the people of Mesopotamia were once again this bridge of ancient civilization as they were in the unique position to connect the continents. And so Mesopotamian merchants will bring information, technological inventions, spices, riches from around the Middle East. And this will lead to increased commercial travel. And so to carry their heavier loads, one of the first contributions is going to be taking the wheel from ancient China, attaching it to an axle, and inventing a chariot or even a wagon to pull heavier and heavier loads. Um, now, when it comes to um, the role of women, in some Mesopotamian cities, um, women enjoyed special powers and privileges that were not seen anywhere else except in Egypt with Hatshepsut for many thousands of years. Women could own property, they could own their own businesses, and they had certain legal rights. However, just as it is in most societies around the world, women were supposed to be at home and taking care of the children, and if they were wealthy enough, to be in charge of the slaves. But just like Egypt, Mesopotamian women had high levels of responsibility. Now here is a big difference between Egypt and Mesopotamia. We know that if you're good in Egypt and your heart you know, is balanced on Osiris' scale, you go into the happy valley of food. Well, in Mesopotamia, when you died, whether you were good or bad, you went into a dark, gloomy cave and you literally ate mud. I know it sounds funny and kind of sad and pathetic, and it is, you went and you ate mud, but that is what you did. And the reason we believe for that is life was so difficult. There was the unpredictability of the floods. Is there going to be a famine? Um, is the water going to wash your crops away? Do you have to go out and rebuild the dams and dikes? Do you have to um, redig the irrigation canals? Uh, and then as soon as you get that, now here comes an invader who tries to destroy and take over your city-state. So life was so hard that your afterlife was going to be just as bad. Um, scribes, um, the biggest contribution made by ancient Mesopotamia was the invention of the first known form of writing right around 3200 B.C., um, students used to write in a wet clay tablet with a sharp stick um, called a stylus, very similar to a pencil. Um, just like Egypt, uh, you know, you wrote a picture, um, something that resembled a thought or, or a belief or an idea, like the bee and the leaf that I told you guys about and Kathy guessed correctly. Um, so young boys were given to very strict schooling. Since you were writing on clay, if you messed up, um, you were severely beaten. It reminds me when I was in school, 
Um, Sister Mary Teresa did not like my penmanship, so when I turned into paper and it was bad, I would have to put out my hands and she'd come by and whack them with the ruler. And eventually I said, hey, Sister Mary, do you think if you didn't whack my hands, I might be able to write a little neater? And the response to that was getting my hands whacked again. So eventually I just stood there and held them out because I knew it was coming. But oh well. These young guys were beaten. Um, training was super strict. If you were untidy or you wrote without permission, that was your punishment. However, if you passed... Um, you got, once again, just like Egypt, a great job working for a merchant or for a temple or for the king. So you had the access to upward social mobility. And particularly gifted students were taught other things like math and literature, medicine and religion, what we will come to know as the liberal arts um, curriculum. So anyhow, that's what we got going on. Um, in general. And now we're going to get to the different civilizations that made a contribution in this area. Number one are the Sumerians. And here is the um, uh, one of the ancient ziggurats that's you know in Iraq. Here's the wheel and here's an early known form of cuneiform. Sumerians from southern Mesopotamia, the, like from Baghdad south in Iraq down toward the Persian Gulf. And these Sumerians are going to create a number system based on 60. Why 60? Don't really know. But when you guys are bored in my class and you're staring at the clock waiting to get out of here, the ancient Mesopotamia or Sumerians created the idea of the 60-second minute, the 60-minute hour. And so when you stare and turn at my clock, you can see it is a circle, a 360 degree circle, timing out seconds and minutes. Um, they also came up with attaching the wheel to an axle for the wagon or for the chariot. So the Sumerians were the first group that makes a significant contribution. And again, invasion and conquest were very commonplace in the Middle East as you know, warfare, trade, and migration um, are things that do advance um, culture. So as a nomadic band, a barbarian group came in to conquer, um, they are going to not only loot and gain riches from Mesopotamia, but also spread and diffuse um, culture like a cue ball playing the game of pool. So anyway, um, as I was saying, I forgot ahead of my, here's another um, ziggurat, um, complex religion, just like everybody else. The Sumerians were polytheistic, once again, worshiping the many gods and goddesses of nature. Um, war, strong warrior males are going to eventually replace um, the priest kings, and as usual, everybody goes um, to a gloomy pit place and eat mud. In the center of the cities, you had your religious buildings, your ziggurat in the middle of the square, and directly opposite that was your governmental buildings. Sumerian social order is pretty much just the way it is in ancient Egypt, but again, instead of a divine pharaoh, you have the chief servant of the gods, the king, followed by the high priests, skilled artisans, blacksmiths, goldsmith, you know, copper tailor, brick maker. And the bricks that the Sumerians made are pretty much the same that we make today. Instead of baking them in the desert, we bake ours in a kiln. North Carolina is one of the largest brick producing states in um, the country. As you see, the color of bricks is orange, much like our wonderful clay soil we have to dig in. Underneath that were skilled merchants and traders, farmers, unskilled laborers, and then um, slaves. So, um, you know, writing, once again, um, as we said, was used for the recording of, of myths and legends, prayers, and then eventually like tax records and laws and in treaties. So writing is an essential part um, figured out by the um, Sumerians. 
um, from ancient Mesopotamia. And so after the Sumerians in 2300 BC, we get this bug-eyed looking guy named Sargon the Akkadian. And the Akkadians are kind of warriors who come in from the north um, near Turkey and they will lay waste to the different city-states in Sumeria as Sargon the Akkadian creates the world's first empire of different cultures. He will come in and combine all of these different um, peoples and subject them to his rule. He will give way to the next civilization known as the um, Babylonians, kind of like you guys when you're talking, you're always Babylonian. There's your world history joke of the day. And we get this guy, Hammurabi. A lot of you guys have heard about King Hammurabi, who will take over from Sargon several hundred years later and bring most of Mesopotamia under his strict control. Now, Hammurabi is most known for his code of conduct where he wrote a series of 282 laws that were written on 12 pillars, one to every gate of his capital city, and one plunked right down in the middle. And legend has it that Hammurabi was kind of distressed by the inconsistency of his laws. So he climbs a mountain and he meets Marduk, the chief god of the Babylonians, and Marduk hands him these laws on these pillars that Hammurabi takes down the mountain, very similar to the way that uh, Moses received the Ten Commandments um, in the Hebrew um, still book of um, Exodus. And what was happening in Babylon is, let's say one day, um, Max stole Connor's chicken. And we say... All right, hey Max, give Connor his chicken back. It's Friday and just apologize. Then on Saturday, Sydney steals the same chicken from Connor. Rather than just have to apologize, I'm bitter, I'm angry, it's a weather event, we're missing school, and so Sydney gets her left hand chopped off. It's the same exact crime with two different punishments. So Hammurabi creates the code of Hammurabi, this very um, strict legal code. Problem is, it was very, not only was it very rigid and very tough, it was also very unequal. If a poor man did something to a rich person, let's say he runs over his foot and, and with a cart and breaks the rich person's leg, then they would get a sledgehammer and break the poor person's foot. But if a rich person ran over a, a poor guy's foot with a cart and broke it, all he would have to do is pay a fine and the poor person. The people who got the strictest punishments were women. So the poorer you were, and if you were a woman, you received the strictest and harshest punishment. So while they're written down, called codified, which means it is written down and it won't change. You now know what the punishment for the crime is. They were highly, highly, highly unequal. Following Hammurabi as a great Babylonian leader is King Nebuchadnezzar. He's an interesting guy. He will widen out and create a much larger empire for the Babylonians but he does something a little different. As he conquered an area, he said, look it, I will let you keep your local government, your local customs, and your local religion. If it's working, if it's not broke, why fix it? The only thing you have to do is pay homage to me as king, pay me taxes, and supply my army with soldiers. If you can do that, then life can go on as it always had. So he was the first very tolerant conqueror of the ancient world. Except for one group in the ancient Middle East he couldn't stand, and that was the Hebrews. For whatever reason, if you know the story of the Babylonian captivity, 
Nebuchadnezzar really wanted to exterminate the Hebrews. So he was tolerant of everybody but them. And several other conquerors like Alexander the Great are going to follow his model. One of his great contributions, and I'll tell you the story if you guys ask me when we see you again, is he builds the famous hanging gardens of Babylon, this giant famous temple that overgrowed with plants and animals for his homesick wife. Unfortunately, only about a three-foot section of it exists in what was Saddam Hussein's old palace. All right, so the Babylonians are on top for quite some time. And then they will be toppled by one of the mightiest empires of the ancient Middle East, and that is the Persians from ancient Persia, what is today Iran. Usually the Persians are painted as the bad guy in world history due to their wars with Greece, and this is, you know, one of the, the, the namesakes of that. But really, um, they were invaded. And so when it comes to the Persians, we're going to talk about first about a guy named King Darius or King Darius. And he conquers much of the Middle East, Iran, Iraq, parts of Turkey, down into Saudi Arabia, um, you know, over you know, modern day Lebanon, Israel. And he looks at his kingdom and he realizes it that's too big for one person to govern. So he breaks it up into 17 different satraps or 17 different states. And in a state, he um, set a governor. That governor was in charge of that reason, region. Collect taxes, ensure justice. You were the king's um, representative there. So I like to think of the satraps, again, like we have you know, the president in the 50 states. The 50 state governors are like these in charge of these satraps. Or you can think of the game of golf. There's 18 holes in, uh, in a game of golf, and, and nearly 17 of the 18, I will hit my ball into a, say it with me, sand trap. And since the Middle East is full of sand, they're called sad trappies. There you go. Now, the king knew that he couldn't really um, trust all of his governors, so he appointed what he called the eyes and the ears of the king. These guys who would wander around and they would interview poor people and traders and merchants and nobles. And if Darius found out that you were being mean or abusing your power, you would be invited to the palace. You would have a large festival in your honor full of your favorite, you know, foods and your favorite band. And then when you would go to sleep, you would wake up a foot shorter because your head would be chopped off and stuck on a spear point and rode throughout the kingdom. King Darius had to pull that trick one time. With great power comes great responsibility. But one of the things that he does is brilliant is he builds what is known as the Great Royal Road, running from the shores of the Mediterranean, Aegean Sea, and Turkey, right smack dab through the middle of the Tigris and the Euphrates. It will be an essential part of what will become known as the Silk Road. It was a road 1,600 miles long that could be traveled by a group of, of relay riders in 10 days. It was built to, to, to speed communication it was built to so the army could move through the empire quickly and trade. Every 20 or so miles, a fresh water well was dug. Fig and fruit trees were planted. And there was a hotel for traders to stay as long as you were a merchant. Um, and one of the things he did was he went a little crazy and he made everything in his empire standardized. Everything from the size of wagons, the axles and the wheels all had to be the same size. He standardized weights and measures, meaning that everything cost the same. A loaf of bread in Iran would cost the same as a loaf of bread in Egypt. Everything had to be equal, another way to unify his people. So King Darius, not a bad guy. Next, we get to one of my favorite groups known as the Phoenicians. And they grew along the eastern edge of the Mediterranean, modern day, you know, Israel, um, Lebanon. And 
they were long distance sailors. Um, they didn't really have a land empire, but they built ships and they traded way out into the seas. We found Phoenician pottery in southern England, so we know they made it out of the Mediterranean up into the Atlantic. So I like E.T. Phone Home, I call them the Phone Home Phoenicians. And what their contribution was is they spread cultural diffusion around the Mediterranean. They took grain and geometry from Egypt and shared it with the Greeks in exchange for olive oil and marble. And in exchange for olive oil and marble, they went over to Italy and found out um, you know, how to make wine. And so they spread ideas from the Middle East, from North Africa, Southern Europe, and they taught everybody what everybody else was doing. They created a very quick, flexible alphabet, much easier than drawing pictures. Um, so they could write down tax records and, and ideas. And the Phoenician, when you, you know, hooked on phonics, you know, like um, Nebuchadnezzar, and you're clapping out the, you know, syllables. Um, well, that is comes from the ancient Phoenicians. It is the ancestor of the Greek and then later on Roman Latin alphabets. Next, we have the Assyrians. And the Assyrians are very angry and mean and warlike. That's why they are the Assyrians. And they are very violent, savage warriors from the upper Tigris, what is today like Syria, Jordan, and Turkey. And they were different than Nebuchadnezzar they used this savagery and tear to keep people in line. And they were led by their famous king, Assurbanipal, who is kind of like the precursor to Vladimir Putin, who likes to wrestle drugged out bears. Well, Assurbanipal would go in and wrestle, if you can see that glyph right here, he would wrestle like young lions because he was just a big tough guy. And there's the story of a village that resisted him. Um, they wouldn't surrender. So he had his men build a wall around the city, and they hung big spikes on it. When the village men came out to fight him, they weren't killed in battle. They were captured, and then they were impaled on the stakes of the city. Then they built a big, giant wooden stake and took the village elders and put them in like this giant teepee of wood. And then the warriors who were killed were skinned, their skin was wrapped around this big like bonfire and the elders were lit on fire. The women and the children had to divert a channel of the Tigris River into their village so it was washed away. Then they became slaves. That's what happens when you mess with Assurbanipal. Um, however, despite his very violent and, and, and angry reputation, he will collect all the works of learning from everybody he conquers, and he builds the world's first library at Nineveh to contain volumes of ancient learning. So a very quick, short-lived empire with the Assyrians, because people can only be beaten down so much before they get um, angry. So next, um, we have the Hittites. The Hittites are pretty easy to remember. They like to hit people. And I liken them to like the orcs from Lord of the Rings. You know, they're down there underneath, you know, the tower building all those weapons. You know, they're dumb as like bricks. But what they can do is make iron weapons. And what they did was they learned how to extract iron from ore. Iron is in little pockets in iron ore. And when you heat it up, the iron will liquefy and kind of melt. So probably some Hittites were making a fire out in the desert. They got some rocks around. They built a big fire. The ore ran out. In the morning, it cooled. And they realized that they could shape it to make stronger weapons like the doofy, stupid orcs. Um, so um, they were used this iron to quickly conquer the Middle East. A branch of the Hittite family were the Hyksos who came down into Egypt here. They tried to keep the uh, um, iron making a secret, but as soon as word of it got out, they were quickly and easily um, defeated. 
The last group of the ancient Middle East here are the Hebrews. And they are going to be different from everybody else in the Middle East. They give us the first long-lasting look at monotheism. While everyone else around them is polytheistic, the Hebrews believe in one all-powerful, all-knowing God. We got one guy that does it all. Now we'll get more into the Hebrews next unit. And we've got Rosh Hashanah and, um, and Yom Kippur happening right around this time. And so the Hebrews are kind of different from everybody else, and they kind of draw everybody else's anger because of their religious belief here early on in Mesopotamia. The Old Testament is a history of the people. And we know that a lot of these events happen because how you corroborate things is you ask four or five people and you look at the common commonalities. Well, things that are mentioned in the Old Testament are written down by the Assyrians, by the Babylonians, even the Persians. So we know some of this stuff happened. And what is essential is that God or Yahweh will form a covenant, which means a contract. It's a two-way partnership. I will do this for you if you in turn do this for me. And to help out, um, God will give the Hebrews a rule book. Um, you know, the, the Ten Commandments and the Torah. This is what I need you to do. I'm going to spell it out. And if you can do these things, you are my chosen people. You are going to be good. And every now and then, the Hebrews are going to stray, so they send inspired messengers, prophets, people like Noah and Moses, and like Joseph, to kind of remind people about the covenant. So it will be a long-lasting religion that will also come about here in the ancient Middle East. It will spread worldwide. It is the foundation of two other monotheistic faiths, Christianity and Islam. But we'll talk more about that in our next unit. So that is a quick look at ancient Mesopotamia. Um, remember to ask me about Nebuchadnezzar. Um, remember to ask me about, um, I'll show you some of Hammurabi's punishments. And listen to that podcast, read over the, um, you know, read it over, try and answer the questions. And um, we'll try and get this test out of the way. I'll help you guys out on it as best I can. And try and look for similarities and differences between ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia. Things like the power of the king or the pharaoh. The differences in where you go for religion. Um, you know, how they both shared strong central authority, complex math, and organization. Try and keep those things in your mind. Stay safe. If you have any questions, feel free to give me a shout. Over and out, guys. We'll see you soon.